All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a very special treat. We are going to be entering into the world of spy novels. And speaking of spies, weren't you almost a spy? No, maybe. Why? Well, okay, yes. After September 11th, uh, had a nice, you know, it was like six-month recruitment interview process with the CIA. But yeah. but we didn't use the term spy. We used the term clandestine operative. That oh, was, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think spy novel rolls off the tongue a little bit easier than clandestine operative novel. Yeah. But, you know, still exciting. Yeah. Uh, I could have driven an Aston Martin. I could have... Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen... Jet-setted. I'm not a spy. Chances are he's not a spy. Um, and I'm not even going to broach the subject if our upcoming author is a spy, but you're going to really love this conversation. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Sons of History podcast. I'm Dustin Bass, not a spy. And I'm Agent, uh, I'm, I'm Alan Joaquin. Very nice. Well done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to let you know, uh, obviously we've been on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, all those places. We are now officially on Amazon Music. So you can find our podcast on Amazon. Um, We're on Amazon? The, yeah, no kidding. Search oh. the Sons of History. Yeah, they sent us a little invite. And uh, there you have it. Huh. So, now, I know that you can watch the videos on YouTube, but you can also now, uh, Spotify reached out to us not too long ago, uh, to have our videos uploaded on Spotify. So you can actually watch the video version of, Sp of our podcast on Spotify as well, not strictly huh. the audio version. You know, now that so, Musk... Uh, getting, yeah. We're getting spoiled. A Elon Musk, now that he's going to be taking over Twitter, we I should... I doubt he is going to do that, but go ahead. I, uh, You know what? They're making efforts to was it they they did some kind of a thing now that they have so that he wouldn't be on the board of directors. Mm -hmm. So he does have a plan B. He does have he a, does plan, have a B. plan B. But you know, I think maybe we should get back into uh, Twitter. If uh, I was thinking the same speech, thing, if you know? if free speech is allowed on Twitter, we'll jump back on yeah, there. Yeah, um, so and I speaking of free speech, um, this has no correlation with it, but this week in history. <laughs> All right, speaking of free speech, however, my This Week in History sort of has a little bit of a correlation there. April 24th, 1800, the oldest federal cultural institution, the Library of Congress, America's oldest federal institution, cultural institution, the Library of Congress, is created out in Washington, D.C. Um, it is the world's largest library. Um, probably not even close. That is approximately 145 million items in its collections. Check this out. More than 33 million books, 3 million recordings, 12.5 million photographs, 5.3 million maps. You would lose yourself in that. Um, 6 million pieces of sheet music, 63 million manuscripts. And it doesn't stop there. About 10,000 new items are added each day. Um, it is the bastion of what is the culmination of free speech. Um, yeah, I would love to get my hands on libraries such as that. You know, the best library I ever saw was in Salzburg, Austria. Really? Yeah, where they filmed The Sound of Music. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, you know, the backyard with the lake and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, the home that's there, it's actually a hotel, but they, they had this... Wow, incredible library. It was like, you know, when I move out of my parents' home, that's the kind of library I want to have. So, anyway, so for me, uh, my This Week in History, what? You're such an <laughs> idiot. <laughs> well played. <laughs> my This Week in History was 80 years ago today. Hmm. Since this is coming out on Monday, April 18th. Yep. On April 18th of 1942, one of the most dramatic events in world history. The Doolittle Raid. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I mean, it thrilled the whole world, except for, of course, the Axis powers. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Pearl Harbor had just happened a few months prior, and you know, Franklin Roosevelt was pissed, and it's like, okay, we're going to bomb Japan. So a guy named Jimmy Doolittle, who was a lieutenant colonel at the time, um, they, they had 16 B-25 
Mitchell bombers. Now, these are these were army. This is before we had the Department of the Air Force, right. but the army bombers uh, they weren't the kind that took off from aircraft carriers. They weren't made to take off from aircraft carriers, and aircraft carriers weren't made to have medium sized army bombers. You know, yeah. normally it's just a little navy plane, but but that's what was so significant about this. So. Uh, they had um, you know sixteen of these uh, bombers never ha- never been done before where they were going to take off and go bomb for the first time ever Japan was going to be bombed the capital of Japan was going to be aerial bombed so uh, they were on the uh, they were put on the USS Hornet the Enterprise was there as an escort um, and the plan was to get about you know I've read different ones depending on whether you're reading nautical miles or real miles it was about four hundred to five hundred. Miles from Japan, they were supposed to take off. Well, they were discovered uh, about 750 miles. There was like a patrol screen, a Japanese naval little patrol boat. Mm -hmm. Saw them, reported them back, and um, they bombed uh, the the ship and they captured most of the crew. Some, the captain killed himself. But anyway, um, so they're like, okay, well, we're here. We might as well do it. But they left about 10 hours early mm-hmm. and about 200, 250 miles further out than they had planned. But they took off anyway. Um, all 16 took off. One of them had to go to uh, the Soviet Union. But the rest went and they you know, bombed uh, Tokyo. They bombed Japan. And I mean, people who were there, Westerners who were there from embassies were talking about it. It was the most thrilling thing that happened in the world at the time. Um, Fifteen of those bombers did crash land in China because they ran out of fuel. They took off too too far out, and mm-hmm. um, one of our friends, uh, Dick Cole, was uh, he yep. sat right next to Jimmy Doolittle was there. They had to bail out at night yep. in a, a thunderstorm. Um, but uh, you know there were eight, there were I believe eight men that were captured. There were uh, eighty men who took part altogether. Eight of them were were captured. Uh, four died in captivity. Uh, three of them were executed. Um, but you know, it was uh, it was a very uh, very thrilling, like I said, very thrilling moment. Uh, uh, Doolittle actually, Jimmy Doolittle actually thought he was going to be court-martialed because they lost all their planes. But the guy won a Medal of Honor for it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But but if you want to see, we interviewed Dick Cole. He was the last uh, Colonel Dick Cole. He was the last surviving Doolittle Raider. He just yeah. died a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, we have we have his interview. And if you watch the movie Pearl Harbor and uh, Midway. Uh, they do show the Doolittle Raids. So, yep. Yep. April 18, 1942. Yep. Uh, Midway better than Pearl Harbor, but whatever. Yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. But, you know, that's why <clears throat> the Midway invasion uh, took place was because Japan was bombed. Uh, Yamamoto was like, you know what? We need to, like, capture every island within a, you know, thousand whatever yard yeah, radius. Yards, radius <laughs> yards. <laughs> thousand mile. <laughs> Can but that's why, that's why they decided. Here's the plan. That was why they decided to invade Midway because uh-huh. they're like, we need a much larger screen yeah. than we had. Nobody within a four block radius in yes. this, in this yes. city. Yeah. Uh, yes. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, that is This Week in History. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got the author, William Maz, the author of the Bucharest Dossier. You're welcome very much. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic book, historical fiction, spy novel, and as William would say, also a love story all combined into one. Uh, William was actually born in Bucharest, and he actually immigrated here as as a kid. And so there are a lot of uh, direct correlations between more or less his life and uh, what happens in the book. So I think that if you haven't gotten this yet, it came out in March. I highly encourage you to get it. Um, And without further ado, we're going to talk to William about the book and about the Christmas Revolution that took place in December of 89 out in Romania. Are you ready for this? I am ready for this because I remember when those events took place. Yeah. yeah, This This is going to be be exciting. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got William on the line, what we like to call him Bill. Bill, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. We're excited to have you. We're excited to have this conversation. I had told Alan uh, prior that your book is probably was probably my favorite book of the past year. I, I loved it so much. It was just really, really good. Thank you so much. It's kind of you. <clears throat> well, I wanted to, so I wanted to ask you. So this uh, talked a lot about Nicholas Ceausescu and the revolution that took place. Um, do you have an opinion on how he compares? 
to some of the other uh, dictators under the Iron Curtain or behind the Iron Curtain because he showed up in the 84 LA Olympics. And I know Jimmy Carter uh, toasted him and uh, Marshal Tito, 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 whatever, the Yugoslavian one. You know, well, all these yeah, names. Yeah, Tito's is in Austin. Tito. Yeah, I'm thinking the vodka. You're thinking now. toasting. Marshal yeah, Tito. Exactly. Well, yeah, anyway. Uh, so, you know, I mean, what were your thoughts on that one? And then that piss off the Soviets? Did they like, okay, you're going to do that to us? Go to L.A.? All right, we're going to teach you a little lesson. Tell us your thoughts on all that. Uh, I'll be glad to. So I got to go into a little bit of history. Um, first of all, um, Ceausescu was only the second communist leader of Romania. The, his predecessor was Gheorghe Gheorghiu Dej, who took power after World War II. And he was installed by the Soviets actually. And uh, he survived until his death in 65. In 65, Ceausescu took over. <clears throat> now, both Gheorghiu Dej and Ceausescu were Stalinists, very uh, strong Stalinists, believed in a um, harsh centralized system. Um, what happened um, in the USSR during that time was that Khrushchev came along and Khrushchev wanted to loosen things up. He realized the system wasn't working very well. It was a little bit like pre-Gorbachev and wanted to loosen and install certain things that would make the economy work better. He wasn't envisioning a capitalist system, but a looser system where parts of the, of the uh, economy were uh, uh, privately managed, privately owned, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so Khrushchev was uh, drifting away from Stalin. Um, Gheorghe Udej and Ceausescu were both uh, very much against that. And so they started drifting away from the Soviet Union during Gorbachev, uh, during uh, Khrushchev's time. Ceausescu wanted to be um, a strict uh, Stalinist internally, but to be seen internationally as a reasonable fellow that had an independent foreign policy from the Soviet Union and so forth, something like Tito whose Yugoslavia was quite independent in terms of its foreign policy from uh, the USSR. So he and Tito became friends. During the 70s also, um, Ceausescu visited North Korea and he learned about how they were doing business, how strict they were, and they also learned the positives of having a, um, uh, a campaign uh, to uh, aggrandize himself and to make himself into a mythological figure. And so he began doing that during the 70s and 80s where he could find his picture everywhere. And if you didn't have a, uh, a picture of him or, or um, his wife in your office space, uh, you would be arrested or declared, you know, unloyal and be investigated and so forth. His society was, uh, I think, the strictest of all of them, including Russia, which I said was loosening up um, a bit. Um, he held complete power through the Securitate, his secret police. Uh, as I mentioned to Dustin before, they, um, they supposedly had anywhere from one out of four to one out of 20, depending on who you read, people in society as either an agent of the Securitate or an informant. And you didn't know, obviously, who it was. It could be your cousin, your um, neighbor, your classmate, your coworker. As such, um, any uh, words of resistance or jokes about Ceausescu or communism were reported by somebody that overheard you. 
And you would be immediately asked to come to the Sekuritate office and be interrogated for the next nine hours. And uh, with the first, the first time, it would probably only be a warning and be told that you had now had a dossier with the Sekuritate, which was, which brought terror into everybody's lives, right? Now I have a dossier. Um, everything was monitored and bugged, not only through informants, but through telephone. The telephone came with a bug inside of it with a microphone from the factory that heard everything in the room, not just what went on in your telephone conversation. So as such, uh, everybody would put their phones inside a drawer or a closet or wrap a blanket around it or put it in the oven. Um, so uh, in order to have some sort of privacy. Of course, if you are suspected, the Securitate would send an electrician to your, to your house to fix the light that wasn't working and he would put bugs in, in the room. And uh, now, <clears throat> Later, it's been discovered that Securitate had kilometers, kilometers of dossiers. Uh, <laughs> meaning uh, it had stacks <clears throat> kilometers long, okay, of dossiers on millions of people in, uh, in, in the population. So we're not talking about a rare event. We're talking about millions of people having dossiers, which they still control to this day. And we can get into that. They have not been made public. Only very few of them have. So the society under Ceausescu was not only strict and, and hard in terms of the security aspect of it, but there was also an economic part of it which if you want me to, I can go into. Um, during the seventies, Ceausescu wanted to make himself look like a uh, independent actor versus the Soviet Union because he wanted money from the West. He wanted loans, okay? And the West fell for it at the beginning. I believe Nixon visited Ceausescu in 68, uh, was it? And he was feted, like you said, uh, by other presidents. Um, he was thought to have, uh, to be a wedge that the West could use uh, in the uh, Soviet sphere, the same way that Putin's today trying to put a wedge between us and the NATO countries. And so they wind and dine Ceausescu. They thought he was a new kind of communist leader. They didn't know so much about the internal aspects of the country, which is quite surprising how strict and how hard it was. So anyway, he got all of these loans about, I believe $10 billion worth, and he tried to uh, invest them in uh, uh, heavy industry. One of them was a uh, petroleum refining uh, plant, and I don't know what other heavy industry used it, but the point is it never quite made money for him. He was expecting to get oil from Iran to refine, which never quite happened. And so in the beginning of the 80s, well, let me go back a little bit. In the 70s, there was a defection from Ceausescu's Securitate team. Uh, a general, a two-star general named Pachepa, who actually wrote a book, which is uh, quite good to read, um, who defected to the West and he reported what kind of society Ceausescu had internally and all the bad things that the Securitate was doing, including about 100,000 people that it had put into psychiatric wards. Anybody who, any kind of resistance more than once or twice would be arrested and would either you know, be in jail or in a psychiatric ward. So um, after Pachepa defected, the uh, West started souring on Ceausescu. Some of the loans dried up 
and he decided he wanted to pay them back. So in the 80s, he started to do that, but the only thing he had to sell in order to get hard currency, because Romania didn't produce anything that the West wanted, was grain and minerals. So uh, he started selling the grain like crazy and it brought a huge um, uh, level of starvation in the country. Uh, people had, outside of Bucharest, people had um, only a certain amount of meat or grain that they could buy per year. They had little tickets. Um, the peasantry, the, pe the people who actually grew the grain were the worst off to the point where they would, whatever grain they had, they would feed to their children and they would be boiling grasses and roots in order to survive themselves. It got so bad that the peasants, uh, the ones who were working actually on communal farms, um, started uh, getting on trains to come to Bucharest to buy bread. And that got so bad that Ceausescu then instituted a internal visa system, which prevented them from getting on the trains. <laughs> and so they starved. As a result of all of this selling of grain in order to get hard currency to pay back his debts, um, there was lack of food and there were lines for everything. You would walk like I did in Bucharest and Bucharest was the best off, by the way. And you'd find lines of, for people, 100, 150 long for bread, for eggs, for milk, for whatever. Many times they didn't even know what they were standing in line for. They would buy whatever they sold and then trade among themselves as to what they needed. Um, so that was the environment. It was probably the worst off of all the communist states. But I wasn't living in, you know, Czechoslovakia or whatever in Poland, so I don't know how to compare. But it was certainly one of the worst, if not the worst. Well, I'm gonna my next question. I'm gonna set the stage a little bit um, before I ask you the question. Um, I was in my early twenties when the events in your book take place. Uh, I've been a study. Uh, I've been a history lover for many, many years prior to the uh, late 80s. So I'm sitting watching, and I grew up, and I knew about the Iron Curtain. And then in the, in the late 80s, I'm watching, and I see uh, Lech, Wal Lech Walesa of Poland, Solidarity. I remember when uh, in 81, in December of 81, when uh, they cracked down on, on uh, Solidarity. So now a few years later, Lech Walesa, and I know I'm butchering his name, um, is elected in Poland. You have the Hungarians say, hey, you know what, Germans, you want to go into uh, Austria and East Germany? Go right ahead. We're going to let you through. Let you through. So I'm seeing the, uh, Eric Honecker relinquishing power. Uh, the Berlin Wall falls. Poland, the, the communist governments in, in Berlin fall. Warsaw falls. Budapest falls. Prague. I'm sitting and I'm astonished. I... I I, you know, and then I, and unfortunately, what happened in Tiananmen Square this the summer of '89, unfortunately, did not go our way. But I was just absolutely astonished with the things that I was seeing, seeing communism fall. So now we're going to Romania. Now it was sometime in December, uh, Timisoara, Romania. I know Romania was like, nope, what's going on in Czechoslovakia, Hungary. Poland, East Germany, it's not going to happen here. We're not going to allow it. Tell us what happens. Because you're, you're a little bit more detailed about what happened in Romania than I did. But I know that uh, uh, Timisoara is where I, I think it started, but you're probably going to know a little bit more than I do. Well, uh, let us go back a little bit and ask ourselves, <clears throat> why did all those former Soviet satellite countries change? And um, we have to go to Gorbachev. Gorbachev was a different kind of communist. He wanted a, a glasnost and perestroika, you remember, a loosening of, of the fist, a, a uh, introduction to, with, you know, to 
market forces because he saw that the Soviet Union was whatever, 30, 50 years behind the West in terms of its economy. Um, he knew something had to change. And then Reagan, of course, pushed him with his um, military spending and so forth. So Gorbachev made it clear that he was going to change the Soviet Union. And he also made it clear in public and private dictates that he would not interfere like the Soviets had interfered under Brezhnev into other Soviet satellite countries. Never mind what they wanted to do. They, it was up to them to decide. So <clears throat> this was seen by other countries as a, a license to drift away from communism. So all sorts of movements started in all the other countries, which were less strict than Romania. And they slowly, all of them one by one, started having a quote unquote velvet revolution, nonviolent. Um, and they, the communist, country, uh, the communist leaders um, resigned or were defeated in elections and things like that for the first time in, in many decades. Romania was different because Ceausescu believed himself to be impregnable, to be all powerful. And that's what, what, what happens with tyrants who have, lived, who have been in power for a long time is that he believed in a lot of his own propaganda and you can go into the propaganda aspect of it, but he believed he was loved by his people because that's what his sycophants were telling him. And so <clears throat> he thought it was secure. And in fact, he was ranting and raving against Gorbachev. He hated the man for allowing all of these countries to do as they please. In fact, at, at you, I just was looking at a document in which he was trying to push the other, uh, to push Gorbachev and some of the other people in, in Soviet Union to invade Poland uh, and not allow the solidarity movement to enter. So he was a Stalinist to the end, okay? And he used the Securitate to stay in power. So <clears throat> just to give you uh, the facts of the revolution, what happened was uh, Romania was ready for something. Every, they were, everybody knew what was happening all around them, that there were, all the other countries were changing. Everyone hated communism. And they hated Ceausescu, but nobody could say anything because they'd be arrested. Up to the very end, the Securitate was active in arresting people. So in Timisoara, we have Laszlo Tokish, who is a, was a priest, Hungarian. And he was a known um, anti-establishment, let's say, anti-communist, anti-leadership. In fact, he had just given a secret interview to a Canadian media company, which uh, Ceausescu had just discovered. And so the Securitate wanted to move him from his parish in Timisoara, which was large, to an outpost somewhere in the countryside. So he can be kept quiet. <clears throat> they didn't arrest him. They didn't want to arrest him because they were afraid of an uprising or some a revolt. He was well loved. And so they tried to move him, but he refused to go. And the people started gathering around his house. Crowds grew. He went outside and told them to be peaceful, not to start any violence and to go home. They refused, okay? He came back, he came out twice. And then uh, the people started chanting and the chants, <clears throat> was at first were Laszlo Tokesh, Tokesh. <clears throat> and then as the crowd grew, at some point it grew to like 100,000 people through all sorts of side streets. Um, it was down with the thieves, down with communism, down with Ceausescu. This went on for several days. At some point, and... Um, at some point, 
firing started. Now, there is a discussion to this day who started the shooting. There are many uh, eyewitnesses who saw snipers on rooftops who started shooting into the crowd. They also say that the snipers shot into the military people who were personnel who were standing on the sideline. Whatever the circumstances, the army uh, panicked and decided shooting indiscriminately into the crowd. At some point, tanks came in and there were <clears throat> uh, credible eyewitnesses where the tanks rolled right into the crowd, went over women and children and killed them. And it was a slaughter. Over the next couple of days, over 600 people supposedly died there. And I think there were more because there are all sorts of witnesses that said in the middle of the night, trucks came in from the government and gathered all the bodies and brought them to Bucharest to be incinerated. So, and there were many bodies strewn throughout the plazas uh, where the demonstration that held, had been held. So uh, that is how the revolution started looking at it from the outside, okay? And then it spread to other cities, eventually to Bucharest. Now you have to remember that during this period, Ceausescu was in Iran. He had a meeting that had been uh, previously scheduled and he didn't think that the Mishara thing was a big deal. So he left before it, the, the shooting started and he left his wife. Elena in charge. Elena ordered the military to fire. Elena was even harder <laughs> Stalinist than, than he was. And um, <clears throat> so all of this stuff was taking place while he was in Iran and he was making uh, uh, deals uh, in Iran and he had actually brought to Iran gold reserves for himself as a policy in case all of these, you know, winds were going to go against them. So Iran <clears throat> still has those gold reserves. They deny that they ever got them, but he brought them on the plane with him. So um, when Ceausescu came back, he went before the people and it's a televised, you can see it on YouTube, where at some point, well, first of all, he gathered the crowd, he had their securitate, they gathered the most loyal miners, mine workers and factory workers to bring him in the front so they can cheer for him. In the back, after about eight minutes of his speech, you start hearing Kimishara, Kimishara people uh, yelling. <clears throat> And then there was some crackling. People thought it might have been gunshots. They don't think so today. But you can see on the television screen that he was shocked. And at one point, he just stood there frozen, not believing what was happening, that people were chanting against him. Kimi Shara. The screen went blank for the public. Then it returned. Uh, a short while later, and they showed him uh, trying to uh, bribe the, the populace there with uh, promises of an increased salaries and so forth. But for the first time in his reign, people saw a leader that was no longer in charge. And they believed that that was the beginning of the downfall of Chosesk. Anyway, for the next few days, there were more demonstrations. Ceausescu ordered uh, all sorts of military to patrol the streets. Um, <clears throat> there is General Stankulescu that I mentioned in the book. General Stankulescu was sent to Kimishara by his wife, Elena, to head the military. He swears, he swore because he's dead, but he swore that he never ordered the military to fire, which is probably true. They panicked. Um, <clears throat> and he came back, however, and at some point, 
he put on a um, fake cast on his leg when he landed in Bucharest in order not to be asked to come to the meeting in the uh, Politburo um, that Ceausescu was holding because he didn't want to be part of the group while Ceausescu was ordering the murder of his own people. In the meantime, the defense minister, General Milea, was found dead. And the government put out the word that he committed suicide. Now, it was known that Milea didn't want to shoot at the population. So everybody thought that Milea was probably killed by Ceausescu. But nobody can prove anything to this day. I have my own theory inside the book. <laughs> um, anyway, the death of Milea was a huge factor in how the people responded to the revolution because they thought he was murdered. And so all sorts of uh, violence and huge demonstrations uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Bucharest and uh, everywhere else because of that. Ceausescu finally uh, tried to do a second speech, uh, but he was booed and tomatoes and potatoes were thrown at him. And then the crowd started uh, entering the building of the Central Committee. He was forced to flee in an elevator, which as I describe in the book, which is true, stopped <laughs> before it reached the top floor. He was inside with two securitate men and two uh, other politicians. The men opened the door forcefully. The floor was halfway up. So they pushed them onto the floor and then they dragged them up a set of stairs to the rooftop where a helicopter had landed. They got onto the helicopter. The helicopter took off. It was too heavy, too many people were in it. It was teetering, finally it took off. It landed um, uh, in one place in the field. At one point, he tried to call his generals to um, recoup or whatever power he, he uh, thought he still had. He couldn't do it. Uh, eventually uh, went to uh, another town, Snagov, and um, he was caught uh, by a local police and arrested, he and his wife and the Securitate men. And then who shows up? Stankulescu, together with other generals and prosecutors, and they put up, uh, they put on a 45 minute or an hour um, trial, which you can also see on YouTube, after which they bring them out and execute them by firing squad, both of them. Uh, they did it so fast, in fact, that the photographer who was trying to follow them out into the courtyard didn't go there fast enough the, uh, the three-man execution squad uh, started shooting the minute that Ceausescu reached the wall. So the photographer was only able to uh, film the end of it, which is a dust and the bodies of the two on, on the ground. And that's how the uh, Ceausescu's ended. But the firings from rooftops continued. <clears throat> So uh, who are these snipers, okay? Um, on television, you can also see snipers that had been captured because they had been wounded and brought to the hospital. They were all Middle Eastern from various um, countries, Syria, Lebanon, so forth. Palestinian, they couldn't speak any Romanian. <laughs> uh, several days after the revolution, 
the sniping finally ended. All the snipers disappeared, including those in the hospital, the patients. Nobody knows what happened to them, okay? So those are the facts as we know them. So who are the snipers? Who brought them in? And in whose interest was it to have a bloody revolution versus a coup, if that's what you wanted, or a velvet revolution, which probably wouldn't have happened because Shoshesko wouldn't have allowed it. So um, <clears throat> the common belief in Romania today is that Gorbachev had a hand in it. Why? Well, it was known that Gorbachev hated Ceausescu and Ceausescu hated Gorbachev for loosening his grip. Uh, Gorbachev considered Ceausescu a tyrant, uh, had blood on his hands of, of hundreds of thousands of people and who um, was giving socialism a bad name. So they hated each other. General uh, Militaru uh, was a known KGB asset. And he reported after the revolution that there was a coup planned since 1985, but it never came to pass. And that they were trying to do another coup early in, in, in 90, but events overtook those plans. So Ceausescu was aware of coups by the Soviet Union and he had a special unit called U0920, which I talk about in the second book, which was a unit specifically created inside the Securitate to spy on his own people, on his own generals, his own apparatchiks, politicians. Uh, I call them politicians. There was no politics involved, <laughs> but it was his own men, because they're all men who, uh, who he depended upon. And <clears throat> the Securitate was, this unit was there to spy on them. And if any of them were ever found to have contact with outside foreign um, security agencies, especially the KGB, they would be arrested, shot, whatever. And so um, he was very paranoid. He had doubles that appeared in public. Uh, he had food tasters and so forth. So like every tyrant, including Putin today, you grow into a lonely, paranoid figure who only has yes men. Um, and you don't really know what's going on because people are afraid to tell you and so forth. So those are the facts. If you wanna hear about my interpretation, we can get into that if you like. Well, I would like to get a bit of your interpretation, but through the book, you so you have, it's, I would call it historical fiction because, um, cause I know it's a spy novel, but I would like to call, I also call it historical fiction because there's so much history in it an accurate history as, as what you just demonstrated. Um, there's so much that I remember in the book from what you've just said. Um, but you chose to do a spy novel. It's your debut novel. Um, and you're doing a sequel to it. How beneficial was it to utilize a spy novel to tell the story of the Christmas Revolution from a Romanian perspective, but also an American perspective, and to an extent, a KGB perspective? Well, it's not just a spy novel. It's also a love story. So I described the book as basically one of those Russian dolls, a doll within a doll within a doll. So it's a love story inside of a spy novel, inside of a historical novel, okay? So, <clears throat> see, I'm using the medium to delve into other subjects in the book, okay? So I delve into love, first of all, and I think that's a primary subject of the book, how it can endure even under the worst of circumstances and for decades. I look into questions like immigration and the, how the immigrant feels, um, which is a topic dear to my heart since like the 
subject. I came here when I was eight years old. Um, and I delve into political questions like how different are communism and capitalism really in, their, in the way they function? Uh, there was no equality uh, in Romania. <laughs> I mean, only in the sense that everybody was equally miserable, except uh, for the nomenclatura, the uh, upper echelon, uh, which was wealthy because it was stealing from the coffers. Every one of them had offshore accounts in Switzerland, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein. Um, Ceausescu supposedly had uh, billions in offshore accounts, which they never found, by the way. And there was a Romanian commission that went to Switzerland to um, look for them. They, they and the Swiss both agreed that there, was, that there were no Ceausescu funds there, which is a lie. Uh, there, was, there was evidence also that Ceausescu during this time, and not only Ceausescu, but all the other um, communist countries were selling not just the plans, but actual pieces of equipment, military equipment of the latest Soviet made military to the Americans to study in order to get hard currency. Okay, so, and I mean, if, if you really delve into this, it'll blow your mind. The Americans saved billions of dollars in development costs because they knew what all of these systems could do and what the Soviets had during that time from Poles and Romanians and Czechoslovaks um, who were selling them the actual product to study. So, um, I forget, how did that question start? <laughs> well, no, you were able to just tie in all three perspectives from. Yeah. So, so I, I wanted to use a spy thriller, first of all, because I love them. Uh, secondly, because I wanted to create an in-depth one uh, that could take advantage of my knowledge of that period and of that society um, and give one um, more than just a typical spy thrill. I wanted it to be more literary and to be more in depth and more knowledgeable. So I think I wanted to be a real writer. <laughs> well, you, yeah, you succeeded. Absolutely. Um, I, I have to object to the sniper part where you accuse the Lebanese. <laughs> I mean, come on, we're uh, peace loving people. We don't, uh, participate in warfare right? oh, of course not i'm sorry but but you have to realize there's so many factions christians muslims blah 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 in lebanon so I know, I know, <laughs> yeah I know. they're all guilty all right <laughs> I, you know i'm going to retaliate by saying something negative about nodio comunici so you know just... <laughs> uh, where was she by the way during all this I, i've always wondered where was nadia comunici during this time well, the funny thing is, uh, Nadia Comaneci uh, at some point was a lover of Nico Ceausescu, the son of the elder Ceausescu. So a lot of things are tied into Romanian history. <laughs> she eventually left Romania, and I don't know, uh, I don't think she was in Romania at the time of the revolution. All right. Yeah, it's funny to think uh, the uh, 76 Montreal Olympics, you had Nadia Comaneci and you had Bruce Jenner. Those were the two people you know, from, I know. <laughs> <laughs> from that Olympics. So <laughs> I don't know. I'm off on a tangent. Yeah, but... I don't know where we're going to go from there. Yeah. Um... And by the way, Nico Ceausescu was the heir apparent. And he was a, a, a heavy alcoholic and a uh, drug user who used to spend his fortunes because he had many times over in casinos and lost it all in Monte Carlo and throughout Europe. And he was eventually arrested during the revolution because he was in charge of a town, the city called Sibiu. Um, uh, he was arrested for ordering the military to shoot on the population. He was convicted and put in jail for 20 years, let out a couple of years later for medical reasons. And what was it? Alcoholic, terminal alcoholic hepatitis. 
he died a few years later from it. You know, I, um, I mentioned this to you, I guess, a while back during our other interview. Um, there was a girl I was, my first girl I was ever in love with. She was an immigrant from Romania. Um, should have married that girl. I don't want to talk about it. Anyways, um, last question, Bill. Romania today, you had the violent revolution. Has has Romania sort of moved forward? Uh, what is it like there today, or have they never gotten over, um, I guess, the remnants of, of communism? Well, depending on which level you look at. Uh, Romania today is very different than it was during communism. There are no more famines. Uh, everybody has a cell phone. There are today, I mean, you can go down the street and you find good restaurants uh, like any European city, nice stores and so forth. But if you look underneath the patina, every year or so, somebody in the government, including the prime ministers and so forth, get arrested uh, and convicted of um, money laundering, stealing from the government and so forth. And they find offshore accounts. Some of them don't get convicted. Some of them get pardoned by the next prime minister or president. And so that's what happens. The government is corrupt. Now, what happened after the revolution was that the government with the Iliescu had to turn toward a capitalist democracy. And so they started selling uh, government companies. I mean, everything was owned by the government under communism and to privatize them. But all of that process was corrupted. They realized that privatization and the, the turning to a democracy was a great opportunity to become extremely wealthy overnight. So they gave these companies newly privatized away to their friends, families, and former Securitate uh, people. The Securitate kept the archives, which are still kept by them to this day, of all of these millions of people that they had a file on. And they used these, the information in that file, in those files, to blackmail them into passing whatever laws they wanted and so forth. Several days after the government took over, the parliament passed a law that for the first time in history, the Securitate could own property and own companies themselves. They could never do that. Anyway, they formed a syndicate um, between former Securitate officials and present ones. And they are using this information they have in their files to, to control the government, basically, to control the judges, to control the parliament, and so forth. They've become extremely wealthy and extremely powerful to the point where it really doesn't matter which, which um, government is in place or which party anymore. That's what's happening. <laughs> but life in general is, is better than it, than certainly than it was. But it is totally corrupt. I was huh. going to, before, you know, I, I, I've been wanting, I'm going to, I've been, I've been wanting to uh, visit uh, Romania. Is, uh, okay, I know it's off the subject big time, but is, uh, is uh, Vlad Dracul's castle still up there or is that gone? Or That's in Transylvania. You can, uh, you can visit it, but that's, uh, that's more kind of Hungarian lore than it is Romanian. It just happens, Transylvania used to go back and forth between Romania and Hungary. They fought over it because it's right at the border. Yeah, I know in World War I, uh, Romania was a lot smaller than it was uh, after the war. And I think um, they, they captured quite a bit of Hungary, but uh, I always wondered about Dracula's castle, so. Yeah, well, Romania is a beautiful uh, country, actually. It, it, between the two world wars, Romania was very wealthy. It had oil in the place, the oil fields. Uh, it had a lot of grain, it used to be called the breadbasket of, of, of that part of Europe. And yeah, I know you're a Ploesti. 
Ploesti oil fields. Yeah. yeah, that's the one that got bombed quite a bit. It was bombed uh, uh, by the Americans because for half the war, or a little more than half, uh, Romania was on the side of Germany. And then they switched sides. They had a coup at the government in Romania. And when they saw that the Germans were losing, uh, they became uh, allies uh, with the West, with the Americans. So, yeah, uh, Romania throughout history has played this role of never quite knowing which big you know, power to go with because it is a small country relative to the Russians or Germany or whatever. And they kind of always teeter back and forth depending on who's on top. <laughs> reminds well, me, of a, we reminds talk, me of a Yankees fan. We, I mean, we talked about, uh, he and I, we've talked about what the Soviet Union did to Romania um, after the, uh, the Hitler-Stalin uh, pact. And I know that uh, the area known as Moldova, Bessarabia, Bukovina, yeah. something like that, was part of Romania and Stalin invaded. And The Russians took it. Most of Moldova is Romanian speaking. And in fact, it's quite an interesting situation right now because they want to be part of NATO. And they're not going to be let in anytime soon because they're afraid of Russia now. So one way of doing it, they're thinking, is to rejoin with Romania because Romania is already part of NATO. Oh, wow. Huh. That would be a... Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, it really shouldn't be a, a separate country because they're all Romanian speaking pretty much. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm looking at your book. I mean, it, it's fascinating, the um, endorsements you're, uh, you're receiving uh, for this book. So I'm... Uh, I'm quite impressed. Yeah. Um, New York Times bestsellers. Yeah. So um, yeah, you no. said this was, you, you really, really. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. And and Lee Child liked it too. So if Lee Child liked it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anybody anybody with a with a good head on their shoulder is going to like it. See, I'm not much of a spy novel reader. So who, who's Lee Child? I'm not. Uh, Lee Child. I, Jack you told Reacher. Me. Was that yeah. the, uh, oh, that's a Jack Reacher. Game. Yeah, Jack Reacher. Game. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah, so well, you know, I read. I know you're nonfiction history, pretty much all. You know, I like to mix it up a little bit. So, well, I but, do, but I like watching fictional history. So, any movie, maybe, perhaps. You know? <laughs> yeah, hopefully, it'll be turned into one. <laughs> From your mouth to God's ear, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, the the book is the Bucharest dossier. He is William Maz. We like to call him Bill. Bill, thanks so much for, for joining us on the Sons of History podcast. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We enjoyed it. Well, that was a delightful conversation. I had, I had a good time with that one. And, and But I'm a huge spy novel fan. I know that you... Um, I like you the and, historical part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, because as I was uh, telling him that, you know, I was in my uh, early 20s when the, uh, when the Iron Curtain fell. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was the greatest most incredible story event that took place in my lifetime even you know more i don't want to call it exciting but mm -hmm. um you know 9 11 was a very like you know yeah um but this was you know to see those towers fall but but to see the iron curtain fall that yeah. was actually a happy event for right. me and yeah. I, I never never would have suspected because i had read about the iron curtain I never would have suspected that communism would fall in East Europe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because, you know. And you really it, you fall had, like it did, just well, boom, you, you boom, had boom. in 1956, you had Hungary, which made an attempt to uh, get rid of the Soviets. Yeah. And then you had in Czechoslovakia in 1968, you know, you had their attempt. So to just, you know, we just assumed it would never happen. And, mm -hmm. and then to see all those countries fall the way they did. And the Romanian one was pretty interesting because I remember that the Ra Romanian uh, president, Ceausescu, was like, not going to happen here. Yeah. And to see what happened. And, and now we have. Yeah. A book this, that this book really that goes into detail really about goes, it. Yeah. So, uh, and I like I, I enjoy his take on it. I think. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I mean, I didn't know enough about it to, yeah. to say, well, I think you're wrong, you know, but um, so to get his take on it from someone who knows, it, yeah. it was it, something that's definitely uh, people need to take advantage of and read this, read this book and uh, get a taste of uh, what happened. Over yeah. There. It, yeah. You didn't get to treat him like I like to treat you. Yeah. Well, no, no, you're wrong. 
Anyway, you know, I, you know, there, no, there are sometimes your you take, are wrong. Your take on things, I, I, you know, I hold it in because uh-huh. I, I, you know, but damn, dude. <laughs> <laughs> could you be more wrong? <laughs> you could try, but you would not be successful. <laughs> Anyways, all right. But no, it was you know we're I, gonna I, move on yeah. before I punch your throat. But I thought you were gonna slit my throat. That's if you. What was it that I was gonna do? I don't know. It's because of why was I gonna do that? I think it's something about you. Oh yeah, you, I wanted to say Bucharest, and you wanted me to say Bucharest. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was saying, you know, maybe we should have him write a book about the Budapest. Yeah. You know, but then I said Buddha and pest were two different cities, and then you. And then I said, "Yeah, you're, you're being up. a pest, or speaking of a pest, and speaking of a pest, can we move on yeah, to move Bucharest? On. All let's right, I think book and movie uh, recommendation yes, is what I'm wanting to get on to. Okay. I think if we're going to talk about book and movie, the book part, it's unanimous as yeah. usual. You know, it book, goes without saying. Book. The book, book did arrest. I say book, Ooh. yeah, the book arrest of the uh, week. The book of the week. The book arrest dossier. Yep. We both unanimously agree that this is a book you need to read. You're gonna love and, it. Yeah. Like it just, just plain and simple. Like even if you're not a spy novel fan, you're gonna love. You're gonna love the book. Yeah. It just unless you just don't like reading. <laughs> or if you like reading pamphlets or something that's kind of boring. Although I do read a lot of history books that can be quite boring, but at least they're informational. Mm-hmm. But this one has, you know, yeah. I mean, look at the entertainment uh, the, the, the endorsements. Yeah, the endorsements you are know, insane. Just, um, yeah. Um, all right, now for the um, movie. Your movie is what? The now Sound the of movie, Music? Well, no, no, not The Sound of Music. Uh, although that part of the world is close. This movie, now it's not a very well-known movie. I saw it one time. Um, and the reason why I'm picking it is because it has something to do with communism and people. You know, communism, socialism, they suck. I mean, they suck so bad that even Bill Maher is telling these idiot kids that are embracing socialism and communism, saying, oh, let's give it a chance. Bill Maher's like, we gave it a chance, yeah. and it didn't work. It sucked. So... Now, there, there was a book that came out that they made into a movie. It's called I Am David. It came out in 2003. Um, the, the kid who plays David is not well known. It's someone named uh, Ben Tibber. But Jim Caviezel is in it. We all know Jim Caviezel. He played Jesus. Today. Yeah, speaking of Jesus, yeah, happy no. Easter to everybody. Yes, Hope happy, you all had right. any happy Easter one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Jim Caviezel played Jesus in that Mel Gibson movie, the Passion, yeah, the Passion of the Christ, which I think was around the same time, two thousand three. I think that's when this movie came out. But go. yeah, um, so you have Jim Caviezel's in it, and someone named Joan Plowright, which I guess she's famous. She's been in a lot of movies, but Joan Plowright. Have you noticed that you no longer go through the entire IMDb cast like you used to do? Well, that's I what... just now realized that. Well, yeah, that you had... used to go through like ten to fifteen names. Yes, and we could go through that with the same amount of time we could spend on your complaining about it. But in this case, it's because I can't pronounce most of the people who are in this movie. So, <laughs> but yeah, it's called I Am David. It's supposed to be, you know, this little kid named David escapes from a Bulgarian um, concentration camp or gulag. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's a good book. It's a good movie, rather. You know, and again, I didn't read the book, but the movie is pretty good. It's... Worth watching, and um, I, I recommend it. Like I said, it's not very well known. You see, he's under my chair. Huh? You see, he's under my chair. Yeah. She had her that. feet, her paws on the movie. She's doing right. so well. She's been in here the whole time. I it's am insane. David. All right, that's 2003, enough. 2003, All right. Uh, my book is obviously Bucharest Dossier. Spies, speaking of, I was going to go with Goldfinger because, well, that's the coffee mug that I was having up, and whenever I... Watch Goldfinger. I like to turn into Shirley Bassey. Who's that? Goldfinger. No, 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 no. You know, I don't You're even... the man, the man <sighs> with the mightest touch. You're giving me a headache. You that know? golden touch. All right. Uh, so the Goldfinger is in this collection. I've got the collection. This is Bond at 50. Uh, I think there have been like two more that have been made since this came out. Yeah, I heard the. I last love one. the Bond movies. Um, I heard the, the last, last one sucked. sucked. Yeah, 
Yeah. So the the clown who put that together and uh, spoiler alert killed off James Bond. Um, you, yeah. I didn't see it. It's a. I mean, it's a douchebag move. Is it? Uh, was it like did. Star Wars Episode Eight? Ryan. Well, did Ryan Johnson direct it? I don't think so, but no, I think it was a. I want to say it was a foreign director. I want to say it was a Japanese guy. But on well, the one tour, you know, come on. Yeah. The you know that yeah. F. But that's it. Britain. So I was going to say first, you know, the, first they attack us, the, and then they take out James uh, yeah, Bond. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. unbelievable. But no, the the latest James Bond is absolute garbage, uh, and it's and it's sad uh, that that's how Daniel Craig went out. But anyways. There's a lot of good uh, James Bond movies. There's a lot of bad ones, it's too. It's the only James Bond movie I haven't seen. It's yeah. the only one. It's the only one, you know. And, I mean, go yeah. see it, but it's it's not very good. They kill off uh, Felix Leiter. They kill off James Bond. It's a joke. It really is. It's shameful uh, the way they did that. Uh, so anyways, and I'm giving this spoiler because I'm so angry about it. You know, I have a remedy for that. What they should do is... Um, have a woman wake up from a bad dream and say, you know, I had this dream that, uh, the, that, you know, call her Jamie Bond, that, uh, you know, James Bond was a man in all these different dreams and yeah. I'm the real. There we go. Know, yeah. Wake up from a, Should be the, the new three, like five, five. When, yes. <laughs> <sighs> Anyways. All right. Ladies and, and it gentlemen, has to be, and she that ha- brings ha- our show to an end. And it has Thanks. to be someone of the LBG. <laughs> okay. Plus Can we move on? CIA. Uh, MI6. Not going to go with the Walt Disney stuff. Well, which we can't, is jacked we can't up. have these, uh, you know, white males being the, uh, patriarchal. Listen down with the patriarchy. Okay. Yeah. Down with the patriarchy. And no, and I don't want to, all right. I don't you can be find us a, on no Facebook. Instagram, YouTube, subscribe. You can also subscribe to us on every podcast platform out there. Please do so. Leave us a rating and review. Aren't you that doing brings our job? show to my... an end because you're just rambling on and now you've annoyed Did me. Did you do the... Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> www.thesonsofhistory.com. Watch us there, too. <laughs>